Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing the impact that theater has in communities with our special guests, Bryce Alexander, CEO and Artistic Director of the Naples Players, Josh LaBelle, Executive Director of the Seattle Theater Group, and Mike Morelli, Executive Director of the Missoula Community Theater Incorporated. So thank you all for joining us, Bryce, Josh, Mike. It's just great to see you. Um, I hope I, as as directors, how did I do? Was I okay with with my intro? Should I have uh, been a little bit more resonant, or or you know, sh- show a little bit of a humble approach? What do you think? I think you're right on, Mark. I think you're crushing it. Yeah, nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's let's go to you, Bryce. Uh, I, I just want to set this up because we did a we did some research as we always do, and the first theater performance in America that we know of. And I'm sure there were performances earlier, was in 1690 at Harvard. The first theater was built in Philadelphia in 1766. And by the 1790s, there were troops based in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Charleston. Theaters spread from there to communities all over the United States. And so it's wonderful to have you here. We've got Florida represented, Montana, we have Washington State. So let's talk about some of the challenges of live theater in today's environment, what what abides, what has uh, not changed, and what are we doing today in order to bring people into those theaters in a post-COVID world where we've all been isolated? How do we uh, approach this, Bryce? So let's start with you. Uh, Give us a sense of your work uh, in Naples and talk a little bit about how you approach theater in the modern age. Sure. Yeah, the Naples Players is, you know, we're a, a really unique organization, certainly to our region. Um, our mission is to build community through uh, access to the power of theater. And so for us, everything we do focuses on the way that you can engage different audiences to come together um, to share not only an experience related to the arts, but with each other. And so, you know, even in our post performance uh, surveys, you know, we ask, did you talk to your neighbors and do you feel closer to your community because of your experience with us tonight? And so we're, we're trying to think a little more holistically about how it is that we bring people together in, in the current age where um, politics is at the forefront of many, many people's minds. No, really? Yeah, I know. It's crazy to think I, about, but the I'm arts have always pushed, you know? And so how is it that we bring people together from very different ideologies to have a, a productive conversation as part of building community? So we really look at that in three ways. One is through performance, uh, you know, about 50,000 audience members come here a year. How do we help each of those different demographics who live in our community come together to have a conversation with each other or to have a communal experience that builds community? Um, It could be through arts education, you know, uh, teaching people how to express their emotions or host a great uh, Zoom webinar or uh, helping students express their emotions. Or it could be through a wellness through the arts program that we have, where we partner with 40 other nonprofits and the goal is to help their service organizations serve their constituents in new ways. I'll give you an example. Um, We partner here locally with the Naples Therapeutic Writing Center and we take veterans who have uh, PTSD and once they're on the horses and going through the horse therapy, we take it a next step and we help those veterans express their emotions to think through the experience they've had to process their trauma. And so you, we can do that with young women who've experienced trauma in their teenage years. We could do it with uh, people in the hospitals whose loved ones are dying. We could do it with children, seniors, adults, um, people who are uh, have family members who've been uh, removed from the United States. So in all of these different avenues, if we can think of the theater as a central location for communities to come together, just like they did when the Greeks and Romans were doing theater and stopping wars to bring people together, then we can redefine how America sees the value of arts and help the theater and every community be a place of uh, communal building, uh, you know, a sort of societal conscious and uh, a, a place for good rhetoric for people to come together. And one of the things that we want to do with this show is we want to take sort of the entire country. So uh, let's move over to Washington. So we've got basically the caddy corner of the uh, of the corners of the uh, of the country. Uh, Josh, um, how how are you looking at what you're doing over at the Seattle Theater Group in terms of today's body politic, where 
right now we've got we've got people who say, oh, you can't talk about certain topics, right? You can't teach certain histories. You you um, you're either right or you're wrong, and if you're wrong, suppress voice. I mean, how do you how do you deal with with all those issues that that Bry, uh, Bryce was was uh, was discussing and ensuring that that you get to engage a whole cross section of your community. Yeah, um, Mark, it's a great question, and and I suppose in Seattle, the Seattle Theater Group um, has become hyper focused around our vision. Uh, our vision is to be the people's theater, a place where all are welcomed and represented. Uh, and, and I suppose a vision is something that you never really achieve, you're constantly striving for. And you know, a lot of nonprofits, all of us are, are sort of saddled with the notion of having a mission, a vision, values, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I find it so interesting. Um, it, it, it's quite hard for to, to lead an organization and expect everybody to be maintaining a focus that wide. So I found it to be super helpful coming out of COVID um, to narrow the focus, not that we still don't have a mission, but to narrow the focus and become a, a vision focused organization. And I think that helps us connect back to what your question was all about, which is, you know, how, how in this world of, of people staying so separate, uh, whether it's uh, around politics or anti-vaxxers or whatnot, um, I, I think as the People's Theater, we have a responsibility to be intentional about whom we're engaging, whom we're speaking to, uh, and, and to not be afraid of running into uh, topics that uh, may be hard for people to deal with. So, um, so are you saying that that theater by its nature is... Uh, kind of uh, a, a place where all topics are on limits instead of certain topics off limits. This whole idea of certain things, um, uh, the whole the whole anti movement, right? Mm -hmm. I define myself by what I'm against. I'm against woke, or I'm against this, right? It's that I'm against vaxes. I'm against, uh, you know. It just it just seems that that what you're saying is that right, the theater is as you're defining it as a safe space for uh, grappling, and, and, and you can only grapple if things are on limits rather than off. That, that, that's correct. I think it's very dangerous for uh, any institution uh, to get sucked into this notion of drawing lines around what you will and won't do. Um, yes, I think all of us are mindful and none of us want to be, uh, you know, veering into the waters that, that could be hate speech. Um, but truly, um, it's quite disturbing to see uh, how separated people let themselves become. And in the arts, the beauty is uh, we've, we've got the responsibility of, of doing the opposite. I mean, in Seattle, it's quite easier to do, right? My daughter just became bat mitzvah, and uh, we had a drag queen uh, at, at, a, at her bat mitzvah to you know, really deliver that sense of, of place to our guests. Um, many of whom were, were flying in from out of town. Um, and it was a beautiful thing, like out of town in terms of other zones in which that wouldn't have been kosher. You follow? Yeah, got it. Got it. Mike, how do you see things from the perspective of Montana? Are you seeing this, this same um, idea and uh, as a children's community theater, at, but also a children's community theater that serves all segments of the community? You're right in the center topically of, of where people are talking about protecting our children by either doing this or doing that, right? You, you're, you're the, the way we're, we're being communicated with, it's almost like you can't do every, you can't do both sides, right? You can't do, you can't cover all topics. How do you deal with that kind of, of issue and how do you operate um, in this environment? You know, it, it's, two different things for us because we have a, a community theater that's a theater of place here in Missoula. And, and we are, you know, like both Bryce and Josh have talked about, inclusive by design, inclusive by intention. And so we're trying to bring all kinds of folks in and, and I'll get in the room and talk about whatever we can. Uh, and many times that is dictated by the people that show up. 
but our community of practice and interest, which is our little red trucks, which go out all over the nation, you know, we're in 22 different states today uh, doing theater out there. We've got 34 teams on the road. Uh, we'll go to a thousand different locations and we don't, we don't uh, go beyond the bounds of the shows there. Presenters bring us in. We have two actors in the truck. They teach 60 kids a show over the course of a week, started on Monday, perform it on Friday or Saturday, or maybe both. And then they go to the next town. And in that time, what we're doing with children is developing their voice, empowering them to speak, empowering them to find themselves through the art and giving them an opportunity to be something outside of what they're seeing, right? We don't talk to teachers. We don't say, hey, who's your, who's your biggest cut up? Hey, who's, who's your biggest princess? We go in and audition cold and those children have a chance to define themselves differently and work together. And that's that beautiful power of theater that we all know, right? Working together and developing something together and coming to the end different than when you started. Well, that, yeah, and, and, that transcends and that, that. That's really important. What you're saying, if, I, if I'm interpreting this correct, correctly, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, is that you're about a process, not a conclusion, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So talk about that process. If you're not about a conclusion, if you don't have an actual indoctrination in the theater, I, I'd like you all to talk about this. If you don't have a particular indoctrination in agenda, and you all, you've all you all said that you're, you're all inclusive and so on, but if you're about a process, but not about a conclusion, talk about why the process, what, what the purpose of the process of theater is about and, and what that exploration is about within those different settings that you described, Mike, because you're going from place to place and the settings are going to be different. P the audiences are going to be different. Absolutely. The actors are going to be different. Every performance is new, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's exactly right. And for us, I'll, I'll start, gentlemen, and then I'll let you get in there. For us, because we're going from place to place, we have a pretty solid process. We, we teach the scripts the same way. We audition the same way. Of course, what happens in the audition and what happens with the kids is different in every city. And somebody grabs a character and they do something wild with it. And the tour actors say, well, of course they did. Who, who knew that? Oh, my gosh. Oh, that's amazing. Right. The children don't know that, that they're so creative. They just take it for granted that they're going to do something cool. And the process is so much more uh, important than the product in our children's theater, because that's where our mission lies, developing life skills in, in children through performing arts. And so when we do that, what we see is it's got this huge impact. They want to come back year after year. They want to be part of our, our productions. You know, some of them show up to college here and say, wow, didn't know there was a community theater. I only know you from the little red truck. Wow, that's crazy. And they get involved with our productions here, which are, yes, they are about the product to some degree, but mostly they're about people finding out who they are and finding their people. Well, the process creates the product. That's the thing that, that, that really disturbs me about so much about American life today is that you start off with a conclusion, right? You start off with something that you want people to just accept, whereas what you really should be doing is exploring acceptance, right? When you're communicating, when you're, when you're, when you're reporting the news, you don't start off with a conclusion on the news. You go to where the facts lead you. If you're going to develop a product, you figure out what consumers want, and then you develop the product. You don't develop the product first and then tell them what they what they want. Even those innovators who create products we don't know we want are doing it informed by the consumer. So, Josh, how do you deal with this idea of process versus conclusion? How do you take on a new work and explore it? without trying to just imprint um, some meaning on the work from the very beginning, before you even start your rehearsals? So, so Mark, I, I'm, I'm inter interpreting process perhaps a little bit more broadly. Uh, I'm, I'm interpreting and want to take it towards uh, the patterns of, of our business, how we do our business. Um, because I, I think one of the responsibilities we have coming out of COVID 
is to serve a much wider and more diverse population. Uh, plus in King County, the county that we operate, um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the demographics are becoming much more diverse as each year continues. And so what we're, we're, what we're up to is first making a long-term commitment in changing some of our business patterns in order to reach a more diverse audience. Now, is it about diversity or is it about getting everyone into the theater? I mean, it, is about, it is about getting everyone into the theater. But if you look at who's coming today uh, and 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 we've made a commitment to to uh, have our audience reflect at a minimum uh, the demographics of King County, it means that we're going to have to interrupt our process, our business patterns and make so the meaning. The meaning of my question, Josh, forgive me for interrupting me. My question was, it's not just coming from a values point of view. It's also coming from a business point of view, isn't it? If you have a huge potential group of audience members sitting on the sidelines, they just don't come into the theater. You're leaving revenue on the table, aren't you? Oh, oh with, with, without, without a doubt. And the most growing portion of our population right now is Latinx. Um, and we've successfully been able to launch uh, a, a pretty amazing um, uh, concert programming with all artists uh, in Spanish. And um, I think the first year out of the box, about 40,000 people showed up. Um, and, and so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's intentional. Uh, and it is also a big change in where we're spending our, our media dollars. We've, we've dedicated ourselves uh, to spending media dollars uh, with outlets that are that are owned by people of color that are speaking uh, to a more diverse population, and it, it is absolutely great uh, a great business choice to make. I'm I'm appreciative that you brought that up, Mark. Yeah, and and you know we just completed a poll in which we asked, "Have you attended live theater in the past year?" Now this is a select audience, right? But even there, twenty percent of the people who are coming to view a live, a, a theater show. And I'm uh, the people who are on, you know, YouTube live and LinkedIn and so on and so forth. They can't, they can't uh, uh, respond in real time, but 20% are not in your audience. And this is a select audience, right? So Bryce, you know, we've got, we've got a real potential here. We have to get everybody into that, into those theaters. How, would you, how do you approach it? Well, I think it, you're exactly right about talking about process. The mistake that people make when thinking about the arts is that one performance is the end of that process. But in reality, you know, we, we want to think about each production as part of an audience process. We, you know, we, we don't want one audience to come one time and say, look, our audience was diverse this time, right? None of, uh, none of our organizations who are on the Zoom call want that. So we're, we're trying to look and say, okay, how do you structure your programming over several years? How do you structure your programs to challenge at different times and at different audiences so that the process of theater is not just, um, you know, the creation of it, which is a, a really important process, but also the process of an audience learning over time or building community with the people around them. You know, we, we often talk about, um, I'm from Denver originally. When I was a kid, we'd go to the Broncos games. And over time, you'd learn to know who your uh, your seat neighbors would be on a regular occasion. Um, and so you'd start to look for them. The same kind of community building can happen in the theater. And if we can think of each of those productions as one game that is going to have a result that helps build something together, then, yeah, there's a, there's a tiny little bit of uh, end process quality, et cetera. But the whole uh, experience with the theater over several years, there's the process that we want to look at. How do you share, how do you extend that experience beyond the event of the performance for both your audiences and your troupe, your, your, your company? Because as you say, Bryce, right, it's not just an event, right, Josh? It's not just a one-time thing. And, and, and many organizations are doing educational programming surrounding performances or particular plays. Uh, you have uh, conclaves, discussion groups, e receptions, there might be food involved. Um, uh, but how, how do you, you try to make this resonate beyond the event of, of the person buying a ticket, attending for an hour and a half and, and leaving? Yeah, I mean, I mean or, or go ahead, Bryce. 
Well, I'm sorry, real quick. I mean, you're exactly right that there, you can certainly do talkbacks and community engagement uh, events and those kinds of things to build community. But what we're, this is where community partnerships really thrive. You know, what you, but community, right? Community yeah. is, is the whole thing, right? Yeah, I mean, ideally, right, you're starting by thinking about what it is that each community needs to perform and you're engaging them before you even announce that there is something that they can participate in. And so by the time you have announced that tickets are available for them, they already are well aware of how your organization is working with them. They already feel like they're part of the process. Buying a ticket is just a natural next step. And then most importantly, once they've had that experience with us through several iterations of pre-performance activities, then it's how do we make sure that they're already engaged in the next one so that it becomes a long-term community conversation. Uh, Josh, Mike, you want to uh, give, give a cut at this, how, how you create that sort of effervescence? I think community theater was the first social media um, uh, event, right? Because it is all about, commu- right? Social media is about community Community theater is about community. Josh, Mike, how do how do you ensure that your work resonates beyond the the day of the event? I, I could share a little bit. Um, we're we're lucky to have a wonderful team uh, on our staff um, as part of a department that we called um, education and community engagement. Um, and so often, um, this work happens year round. And some of it, some of it is tied to engagements that are coming uh, to our theaters, and some of it is not. But ultimately, it's building relationships uh, with people of all ages uh, and building community with them, and that I I believe helps set up a relationship. Uh, and then our hope is to turn them also into patrons of the theater, so they they will feel uh, like any three of our stages is an extension of their living room, is their home. Uh, and and we're, uh, you know, I'm speaking of programs, whether it's Ailey Camp, which happens uh, for people in middle school, uh, to say dance with Parkinson's, that happens for people with Parkinson's and their, uh, their partners. Uh, we've got a, a host of programs like this that develop relationships with community members in all directions. And, and I believe that's, um, sure, it's a great strategy of, of maintaining this relationship, but it also just makes the world a better place. You know, the, the word trauma is overused. It's used for almost everything. But uh, there is something about the, the facts of daily lives, the facts of your of your history, whether whether and we deal with a lot of uh, different types of trauma. Um, we've done uh, work, for example, uh, with the group that has created um, uh, Greenwood Rising, which commemorates the uh, the 1920s massacre in Tulsa of uh, that, that uh, destroyed the Black Wall Street neighborhood uh, of Tulsa. We dealt with. Uh, native peoples. We've dealt with various isms, you know, of, of various uh, kinds, racism, anti-Semitism, and so on and so forth, sexism. But also, everybody gets beaten up by life, right? Every day. You're a child, you go into school, and you happen to be the target of bullying that day. Or you have been the bully, right, Mike? Uh, you know, you you need to have some place to work it out where it's not in that environment, where it's a little bit more abstract, but maybe it helps you to process your emotions. How do you how do you deal with that that part of, of your work in a way that takes perhaps even a classic work and brings it to today and, and allows people to process their own feelings of, of daily life and, and help them to navigate uh, in today's world. I think that, you know, when you talk about the process of working it out, it, it's working together and, and giving people an avenue to work together and giving them multiple avenues. It's not just the show. It may also be uh, when we put out a call for what would you like to see next year and let's talk about it and let's get on there and let's discuss it. We have people talking about any number of things. I can tell you that when we, uh, we put out our first call for scripts this last year, who, who would like to see what, and we were overwhelmed with rent. 
everyone wanted to see rent. Everyone wanted to be involved with rent. And we were looking at wow. each other saying, why? I, I, tell us why. We want to know, right? And what what kind of answers season. did you get? What's that? What kind of answers did you get? Oh, you know, people talking about you got to find your voice and you got to be able, and especially in Montana, right? And in Missoula, Montana, you got to be able to be who you are and not be afraid. You got to be able to deal with big things that other people aren't talking about. And for our community theater, amazing. It was simply amazing. Out on the road for our children's theater, it's very interesting because, you know, yes, of course, we're helping kids find their voice and we're developing like life skills and those things are great. But we go to military bases all around the world. And one of the reasons that they bring us in is that transient nature of a military family, right? So the military family moves to a new base. Those kids don't know anybody. And MCT comes to town and they work with all these other kids. And all of a sudden that that new child has a bunch of friends. And that first day of school, when they go to the lunch room to go sit down, they have somebody to eat lunch with. Right. And I think we can all relate to that. You all want to find your people and you all want to be able to be OK with what's happening in life. We don't you know, there's a lot of trauma associated with those kids moving across the country or oh, moving yeah. to a new country. New and country, new anything. language, new environments. I mean, I grew up, I grew up in that way, right? And yeah. so, um, you know, there, there are all these differences, the, all these changes, these all these different cha- uh, uh, practices. The fact that you're going all around the world and helping kids uh, process that. I mean, basically, we're all living the same kind of life because things are changing so rapidly. And what you're basically saying is that this process of theater, this process of performance, this process of selecting what you're going to present, all of this is part of that. Let's bring it back into something that we can discuss, we can process, we can control, right? Very much so. And and in a world of chat GPT, right, in a world of, of art being created in ways that uh, that we recognize and we say it's art and then we go, oh, my gosh, created by AI. Working together as human beings, working together and, and dealing with things in the same room at the same time for a shared common goal, that's that's where we shine as humans, as people. So uh, we're going to go uh, back around. We'll start with you, Mike, uh, go to Josh, and we'll end up with Bryce. Um, what is the next great thing in the, in the next year? Because we've come out of COVID. Hopefully, we don't go back in. Right. So we're moving forward. We're all living in this environment in which we're trying to grapple with uh, a whole range of issues, including social polarization. uh, But also you're grappling with the fact that people are becoming media obsessed and and a little bit isolated because we can get basically live theater or or not live theater, um, electronic theater into our living rooms. We actually don't have to come together anymore in order to to experience great performances. What's happening in the next year, 18 months in your world that you think is is uh, going to ensure that your organization stay vital? Uh, Mike, let's stay with you and, and then we'll go to Josh and then Bryce, we're going to give you the last word. We're, we're reaching out and looking for new and intentionally soliciting new voices for our children's scripts so that we're hearing a different kind of voice so we can celebrate the commonality of all different kinds of people out on the road. That's that's interesting. So basically, whatever you've done before defines what you're doing next because you're not going to do the same thing. We're going to add those in. We're not going to do it in place of. We're going to add those right. in because there's, there's obviously, uh, I shouldn't say obviously, but we've been doing some of these scripts for 40 years. Um, Everybody knows them, for better or for worse. And so adding new voices is is important to that. Well, it's true for any art form, right? If you're a musician and you're only playing the golden oldies, you become a golden oldie. Whereas when you keep creating, right, you keep yourself fresh. Josh, what's happening in Seattle for the next uh, 18 months that you're particularly proud of? Well, first of all, um, Mark, I completely disagree with the statement you just said. Oh, okay. You've- you do have to come together in person to experience great performances. Sure, you can tune in on Zoom like people are here, and it's nowhere near the same ever as going and showing up. It, it is, I'm just going to say it, it is a lesser experience 
performing arts on your computer. So I want to just refute that and not let that slip by. Um, there's a lot going on in, in the Seattle area. And, and I would say if, if, there's, if there's one thing that I know so many of my colleagues in Seattle are focused on, are concerned about, it's that we must change our region in a, in a way that better enables artists to make a living and stay here doing only their, their, their art. Um, and it's a, it's a, uh, it's a big pickle jar for us to figure out. Um, but we must do that in our region in order for our performing arts sector to stay healthy. Local arts matter a whole lot. Well, thank you for correcting me, Josh. I'm always, always, always happy to be educated. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Right. You also can agree to disagree too. I'm 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 down with that. I just wanted to be real clean about that 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 notion. No, I, I I actually agree with you. My most memorable experiences have always been live. If you if if you look at that sort of immediacy and being in the moment and 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 having someone uh, sometimes in in a in in a performance which is great and sometimes not so great, but that particular person affects you, and you have that immediacy. It's it's there's nothing like it. There's absolutely nothing like it. Bryce, what what are you particularly proud of uh, in the next eighteen months that you're going to be doing, and what will you be doing that is perhaps a departure from what you've done in in the last uh, years? Sure. Yeah. Well, we're we're particularly excited that our brand new facility will be coming online. It's a, a renovation, actually, but we'll have three full theaters available to us uh, in our new facility here. So that that will make a big difference for us. But in terms of exploration of things we haven't done before, you know, we're we're really looking at the concept of how it is that younger generations, and we're really talking Gen Z and below. You know, how are they choosing to engage in performance? And uh, we're really looking at sort of short form performance uh, experiences that um, are sort of like, I guess, uh, like a TikTok concept, but of live theater in a 20 or 30 minute uh, forum, as opposed to a, a oh, wow. forum. And, and how do we get them to put their voice into expressing through live theater together, as opposed to uh, through TikTok or whatever. So we're, we're kind of exploring the, the digital amalgamation of live theater and how it is that we can make it an in-person experience, but that feels and mimics that same sense of social appreciation from their peers. Uh, so I, I'm pretty excited about that. Very, very cool. Bryce Alexander, CEO and Artistic Director of the Naples Players, Josh LaBelle, Executive Director of the Seattle Theater Group, and Mike Morelli, Executive Director of Missoula Children's Community Theater. Thank you so much for sharing your great work. Please share, please thank your people, your staffs, your boards, your funders, everybody who supports your work. You're so important. You really are so important to the the uh, fabric of the United States, you and your fellows. Um, the This ability to bring people together in this immediate experience of performance that allows us all to think through our lives is, is so critical to our own joy. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so have, much. Have a great day, all. Take care.